Praise the Lord. I won't want to leave now. I mean, I, 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 he plumped me up. Praise God. Praise God. I'm honored to be here. I, I want to thank your pastor and his wife and his congregation for having me back again. It's just, uh, we look forward to it. And when he called, I began to pray, seek God. And uh, I'm just going to give you what God's put on my heart. Just thank you. Yes. Lord. I want you to listen and I want you to receive it. But before we get started, I want to give you a scripture that God gave me. It's after I talked to him, I started praying about this revival. And most of you have read this scripture probably before you go to sleep or not. Most of you have quoted it. It's in Job chapter 22, verse 28. It says, You will also declare a thing, and it will be established for you. So light will shine on your way. God gave me that scripture and He began to tell me to declare some things that's going to happen in this church before I get started. Now I don't normally do this. You can, tell, you can ask my wife. But I'm afraid not to. Now how many of you know what God intends to do and what we allow happen is two different things. And you know that you can hinder the Holy Ghost. But now God me that he was, there's going to be people in this revival and people here tonight that's got stuff going on in your life. Amen. It might be family problems. It might be habits. It might be this. It might be something that's been said years ago. And the devil was using that against God's people. Not only here, but all over the world. we got Christians that are in bondage to stuff that the devil is emotional. It's emotional baggage. Yes. And some of it's got to a place where it's a spiritual problem. And God says that there's going to be people that come through this door, and some people here tonight, that God says, I'm going to change them. I'm going to touch them. I'm going to minister to them. Some of you are going to go out of here, and you're going to be blessed so much by the power of God. I'm not talking about joy. He's talking about goosebumps. I'm not talking about goosebumps. I'm talking about the power of God's touch. If there's ever a time God's people need a touch from the Holy Ghost, it's now. But you struggle with these things, you've been struggling with this, struggling with that, whatever it is, it don't matter. God says there's people everywhere have been struggling and struggling, but in this season and in this revival, God's going to touch some people. I declare what God says. And I'm telling you, if you've got people that need a touch from God, if they need a healing, if they need just encouragement, you need to get them to come because God is going to do some things in this place. Do you hear me? That's what God intends to do. People are in bondage. I'm talking about Christians that need the power of God. The Bible talks about in Ephesians, talks about His church. Paul was talking about how God loved His church like a, a man should love his wife and all that. Let's look at what it says here in verse uh, 27. He said that He might present it to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or anything, but that she should be holy and without blemish. And I read that and I said, Lord, I've got some blemishes. I got some wrinkles. I got some spots. I need a touch from you. Every one of us, listen, it's not just me, it's not you, it's all of us need a touch from God. Some area of our life. We need the Holy Ghost just to come, and it might be pride, it might be jealousy. There's things that the devil's using against you to keep you from stepping out into the place that God wants you to be. And God's going to secretly move in. And some of you will go out of here and you'll have a testimony about what God. Some of you want to be sort of style, but you want to know 
story over in Genesis. If you want to turn, I'll read a few scriptures in a minute, baby. But it talks about Esau and Jacob. Esau and Jacob were twins. And we know that Esau was the older one. He came out first and Jacob was a grabbing for his heels when he came out. But it was just his nature. Now when they grew and got a little older, we know that, that Esau was a, like to hunt. So he went off into the woods and he began to hunt one day. And he'd come home and he was starved to death, man. And his brother Jacob, he was a homeboy and he had some stew made. And he said, give me some of that stew. He said, I'll sell it to you for your birthright. Well, he said, well, what good is it going to do me? The Bible says that he despised it. How I many know God stopped him right there and he said he's, got, he's getting tired of this Esau spirit in the church. God's going to move some spirits out of the church. And they're going to get, get delivered or they're going to get, get moved out of God's people's way because this Esau spirit. Do you know that some people know more their children know more about Star Wars than they do Jesus? It's a shame to walk God talking about Christians. you got little babies coming to church who knows more about some of this stuff that's going on in the movies than they Jesus. I'm telling you, there's an Esau spirit. I can take it or leave it. There's some people with the attitude, I'll go to church or I can leave it. That's the way he was. Then they got a little older. He said their daddy, oh, I was old and, and he was getting ready to die and he called Isaac in. Or Esau, he liked Esau because he was a hunter. He said, I want you to go off and find some game and, and bring it back and fix it the way your daddy likes it. And he said, with that, he said, he went off. And he said, when you come back, I'll give you my blessing after I eat that food. Yes. So he went off, and while he was gone, what did Mama do? Mama got Jacob, dressed him up in some of Esau's clothes, gave him that good smell and that hairy little arm, yes. went in, and to make a long story short, he got the blessing yes. that his brother's supposed to give. Yes. His brother come back, Esau, or, or Esau come back, and he was, he was devastated when he got out. He said, when my daddy dies, I'm going to kill you. Right. And with that, Mommy had to send him off to live with her brother Laban. And we know the story how he went and he, he worked for Laban for 20 years. He labored for those two women. Man, God blessed him with all kinds of herds and, and he had servants and he had all kinds of things. And then it came time for him to go back home. God called him back to his homeland. And the first thing that he thought about well, when, he, when he said for God to go, tell him to go back, said he thought about how his brother treated him when he left. He's going to kill him. Ain't that a shame? God's not giving us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Twenty years went by, and the last thing that he remembered his brother saying was, was still with him. Yes, Lord. Some people don't never get over their garbage. Some people got all this baggage and all this stuff. Something that's been said in your family 20 years ago, but you're still hanging on to it. You know what he's doing? It's the devil just trying to trick you to keep you from your destiny. Listen, you've got something you've got to do. You say, well, I'm getting too old. No, God's got something special for you. God's got something that unique to you. And the reason you're having all this trouble and having all this stuff coming, all these waves of problems and stuff, is because the devil's afraid of you. God was telling him, I'm going to bless you like I did Abraham. That the seed, my seed is in you and you're going to be there. He was trying to tell this man that you don't have to worry, I'm going to be with you, just go on back. You think if God told somebody something, that they can trust God and not have to fear. But you see, that's the way the devil wants. He wants to hold things. No matter, you know you're a Christian. You know that God loves you. But still, you've got that fear. You've got that thing. Some people worry about things that happened when they were in school or they were saved. Some people worry about stuff that people said to them or they're afraid to face them and probably that person's dead and they don't even know it. We ain't supposed to. That's the reason Jesus said don't worry about nothing. Amen. Things you're worried about have probably been buried for years. Amen. God's got a way of protecting you. You're His child. He, does, he wants to bless you. He wants you to know that you don't have to fear. Jacob was full of fear. Jacob could believe God for all the big stuff, but he could never get rid of all that emotional baggage. God's going to get rid of some emotional baggage. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So what does he do? After he has this little thing with Laban, his uncle, he says that Laban parted ways with him. And then it says that, that Esau, or, or Jacob, started sending out his servants with all these cattle and all these gifts to appease his brother. 
So he sent one little group out and he come back to, to Jacob and said, yeah, he's coming with 400 men and, and I don't know what his intentions are. Can you imagine the fear that must have gripped him even deeper and harder? But he kept sending out those little pockets of blessings trying to appease him to keep them from killing him because he just knew that he was going to kill him. Yes. And then one night, he says the night before, said he sent his two wives and their children across the river and uh, Jabar, at least how you pronounce it, and he left him alone. And he said he wrestled with the angel of God. Mm -hmm. All night long, this wrestling match went on. And he had such a hope on that man, on that angel, that that angel touched him and knocked his hip out of socket. The Bible says that he lived with that hip for the rest of his life. He had a, But I never had a socket knocked out of joint. Does anybody... But I had a friend that played football and he got his shoulder knocked out of socket. You could hear him squeal, man, the pain until they put that back in socket. Can you imagine the pain that Jacob was in when that angel touched his, his socket in his hip and knocked it out? But here's where God checked me and said, here's the way some of the people are there. They, 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 they have felt that pain for years and years and years. You went through this and this aggravation, but you know what? You didn't, you did not quit. You didn't give up. You've been persistent. Listen, even though that angel struck him in the hip and knocked his hip out of the socket, Jacob had such a hold on him and through his pain he would not turn loose. And neither have you. And God says, good news. I'm going to bless you because you've been persistent. I'm going to bless you because you've been there, done that. You've been here. I want you to go and you stayed there and you didn't give up. Jacob couldn't give up. Can you imagine how much pain he was in? But he was holding on to that angel. And then angel said, so listen, it's getting daylight. You're going to have to let me go. And he said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Woo! Glory to God. I'm telling you, people, there's going to be people blessed. You know why? Because somebody's been praying. When Peter come out, when Peter come out of that prison, and the angel said, follow me, he went right through that prison, past all those guards, and went out in the street, thought he's having a vision, but he realized that God had set him free. But Place. Somebody was at Murray's house praying. Oh, let me declare and agree to you. The reason I've come by here this week to let you know what God's going to do in this revival is because God said, I've heard your prayers. I've seen what you've been crying out for. I know that you mean business and I'm going to bless you. I'm going to touch you. I'm going to heal you. I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to set your mind free. There's people sitting here tonight. Listen, there's things inside you that you
He wanted him to turn loose. And he said, what's your name? He said, my name is Jacob. What was he saying was, my name is a, suppl a, a supplender. That means someone that wants to be out front. Yeah. He was a heel grabber, a deceiver, a con artist. But you know what? Jacob didn't want to be that way. Do you know most people sit here, you don't want to be the way you are about a lot of things. Yeah. But that's actual nature. When they named children in Bible times, if they named like Jacob, that's what he was. He had to live that out. He couldn't help the way he was. It was his nature. Some people, God understands, honey. He understands you don't want to be that way, but you're not giving up. And God says, I'm going to, I'm going to help you alone. I'm going to touch you. Just one touch from me. That thing's going to scatter down the door. Colossians 3 and 13 says, Forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a, a complaint against another, and even as Christ forgave you, so must you do to them. You know what? We need to learn to put up with people the way they are. Yes. Me and Sam have been married 40 some years. And I'm, she's been trying to change me. And God help her, she's still trying. <laughs> but someday she's going to see the light and she's just going to turn me over to Jesus. <laughs> and give her some help. But you see, we struggle with things. There's things about me that you wouldn't like if you was around me. If I was around you, there's things about you. But we're going to have to love one another. That's what we are. And tell God can do a work on us. But God will never do a work on you if you're stubborn as a mule and won't, uh, won't let him give you water. You can take a horse to the creek, but you can't make it drink. Some people's got that Esau spirit about it. I'm going to do it my way. What's this bird right going to do me any good? My belly's are hurting. I'm starving to death. Some people more worry more about the belly than they do eternity. And it's sad what's coming in the church. And it's sad that people are not rooted and grounded in the Word of God. If you don't get rooted and grounded in the Word of God, you're not going to make it. We've got to know that we're in a battle. Yeah. It's not going to be easy. There's going to be pride. There's going to be jealousy. There's going to be a battle all the time. God has given us the power to overcome. Yes. Yes. We'll submit to Him. He said, no longer will you be called. Jacob, but you can call it Israel. Yes, yes. The Prince of God. Yes. What do you need God to change in your life? If I could ask you if there's three things, if Jesus was standing right here, right now, and He said, give me three things you want me to change about you, what would it be? Let me tell you, He can do it. That's right. What three things is keeping you from functioning the way God wants you to function? God wants to get down to business in this revival. Yes. When I leave here, I don't want you to say, boy, I felt the goosebumps like he was talking about. I want you to be changed yes. by the power of God. I can't change you. Yes. Pastor can't change you. Just him, but I don't want me. I can't do nothing for you. But I know the one who can. Yes. He wants to change you. He wants to change you and bless you and let you know you're blessed. Yes, sir. What's your name, Jacob? Uh, what's your name? He said, my name's Jacob. No, no, not no more. You're going to be the Prince of God. Right. Did you know that God has always done this through Scriptures? You notice the man Elijah. Elijah was one of the greatest prophets we could ever read about. He had a showdown at Mount Carmel. Killed all them prophets. 750 of them lived with us. But at the end of the day, a little woman by the name of Jezebel said, I'm going to do to you what you've done to my prophets. And he, a fear came over him. A depression came over him. He ran out into the woods and walked out into the road tree and wanted to die. Man, he was struck with depression and anxiety and everything. Fear was all over him. But listen, as he slept, an angel came. And what did an angel do? An angel touched him and woke him up and said, Eat this meal. It's a long journey. Praise God. One touch from that angel. And he had 40 days and 40 nights. Remember, the man. Moses was raised in royalty in the palace, but he said he killed a man. He was a murderer. Yes. And he had to go to the backside of the desert. And there he, he kept his sheep for 40 years. But one day he turned and saw a bush burning way out on the hill. And as he approached it, something in that plane, something, the power that spoke to him, changed him from a murderer to one of the greatest leaders we have ever known about. Yes. I don't care what your problem is. Knock your socks off, baby. Yeah. That's what he 
But he was blinded for three days. This man don't come in a place like this and drag us out, have us beaten and arrested and sent to bed. He was there and gave the instructions for them to stone old Stephen. He held their coats. My God, he was a mean man, but he wasn't no match for God. I don't care what's going on in your life, it's no match for God. I don't care how bad a demon is in your daddy or your mom. Yes. 
old things will pass away. Behold, all things will be brand new. And Ephesians 2 and 8 says, For by grace we're saved through faith, and that's not of ourselves, but it's a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. But here's what I want to get to. After God transforms us and saves us, He sets us apart. For He said, We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. When did that happen? Before the foundations of the world. Now listen to this. Before God made anything, He had you in mind. He said, one, one translation says you're His masterpiece. God's not mad at nobody. He loves you. He thinks more about you than you could ever imagine. The good things. The Bible says, and the psalmist wrote here, it said, My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lower parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being unformed and in your book. Yes. They all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet none of them came to be. Then he goes on to say that his thoughts for you are more than the sands of the sea. That's the good thoughts. How many grains of sand is on the seashore? But He created you before He created anything else to come at a certain time when you were born. God never was surprised to God when you got saved. At the right time, He picked you. The faith that you got to get saved, honey, will come from Him. It's not new. We just had to say yes to it. But what I'm trying to say, when He touched your life, when He saved you, He not only saved you and let you be born, but He gave you a job to do. Most Christians are slack on God and been for years because they ain't got to know what they ought to be doing. Need to find out what God's got for you, sweetheart. Pray and fast and ask God. Get in His Word and ask Him, Lord, what is it? But God didn't intend for no Christian to be more. Amen. 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 John 15, 16 says, You've not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. In other words, He planted you that, that, that you might be a uh, fruit bearer and that it shall, you can keep it up until He comes. God wants you to know that you have the ability to change other people's lives. Yes. Look what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us. What is an ambassador? If I was an ambassador to China, if Trump would call me on the phone and say, go tell the Chinese leader this, I'd write all that down and I'd rehearse it and I'd go in. Here's what the president said. He'd be like the president speaking himself. Do you realize what God has given you? Some people say, well, you know, uh, uh, it's just for the pastor and his wife and the deacon board to, to preach the word and see people say, no, God has given you that ability. God said that thing just like he was Work at it. Yes. Every day you go into your prayer 
problem that you've got to say, God, you've got to give me unity. Did you know that the reason people can't work together is because the flesh takes over? I'm telling you, honey, the flesh is... This flesh will never do anything pleasant for you or God or nobody. It wants to argue. It wants to fuss. It wants to fight. And I don't care how many years you've been preaching or testifying, speaking in tongues or whatever. It don't matter if you let down and you don't beat that flesh to death with the Word of God in prayer. You know, it will not be unified too long either. The reason so many people are divorcing themselves is simply because they can't swallow their pride. They can't swallow. They can't. The, the, the flesh has just gone in the mess. Yes, again. Mm -hmm. Come on. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3 says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That word endeavoring means to strive for it, to work hard. Yes. You've got to work. You've got to ask God to help you. You've got every day, you've got to say, God, touch me again today. Amen. And Lord, when somebody comes again, listen, the Bible says, I believe it's in Luke 7, that offense will come. What he's trying to say to Christians, don't be surprised. You're going to be offended. But how are you going to handle it? Are you going to let bitterness come in? Are you going to forgive people? Are you going to, are you going to unify with the Spirit? Are you going to let it run off you? You see, we're going to have to learn these things. The devil knows exactly what to say to upset us. But if we're ready for him, honey, he'll watch. But if you've not been in the Word, you've not been in prayer, he'll kill you, he'll destroy you. Endeavor it. Work hard at it. I work hard every day and, and pray that God will help me to unify with the Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yes. I'm going to hurry. The church of God makes us more than a conqueror. Did you see that in Romans chapter 8, verse 37? It says, Now in all things, not some things, in all things, you're more than conquerors through Christ who loves you. Yes. Yes. Now what is a conqueror? A conqueror is somebody that, 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 that can yes. overcome something, got victory over it. Some people give up too quickly when trials and temptation come. But we've got to understand that God has equipped us. He has given us the ability to, to be more than a conqueror. Amen. The psalmist says in Psalms 34, 19, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered them out of them all. Think about that. He didn't say that you never would be afflicted. He never did say that you would be. You would never have no trouble. He said that you'd be able to overcome them all because I made you more than a conqueror. Through the touch of God that's inside of you. Yes, Lord. Yes. Amen. Yes. 2 Corinthians 2 14 says, Now thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. Where's Christ at? He's inside of you. There ain't nothing that you can't overcome if you'll hold on to Him. You're an overcomer. You're more than a conqueror because of what God does for you. My God, if we get this down in our spirit and realize, I don't care what happened. Rain, snow, sunshine, what it don't no matter what's going on in my life. God is in control. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Matthew chapter 8, verse 1, it says, And when He came down from the mountain, I'm going to close on this with the touch of God heals. So when he came down from the mountain, said the great multitude followed him, and behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Now look what he said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Yes, Did you know that this leper, he knew that Jesus could heal him. Yes, he risked his life. He left the colony probably, run out of that colony, one supposed to be around people, one supposed to touch nobody, and came and bowed down in front of Jesus and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can, you can, you can heal me. He knew that God could heal him. In so much that he risked his life of being killed, probably stoned by those people. Do we believe that God can heal anything? Do we know that it's already done? The stripes he took. And when he, before he died on that cross, he said, it's finished. That the work is done complete. He's done it all. Do we believe that? This man believed enough to come out of his comfort zone, knowing that he could be killed and knelt down and said, God, if you can, yes, you'll do it. Mm -hmm. If you're willing, you can do it. Jesus said, I am. That's what he said. Yes. Then he put forth his hand and he touched him, yes. saying, I am willing. Be clean. And immediately, the leprosy left him. Mm -hmm. Matthew 9, 24 says, And he said unto them, Give peace, give pace, place. Well, the maid is not dead, but sleeping. And he laughed, and they laughed him to scorn. But when he, but when the people were put forth, 
He went in and took her by the hand. And the maiden arose. He touched her and brought her back. Verse 9, chapter 9, verse 35 says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogue and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Here's what a lot of people are missing. You preach, you teach the Word of God, and then God shows up with signs and wonders. Amen. Jesus went around all the villages and all the cities teaching and preaching. Then He says, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. That's what God wants to do in these last days. He, he wants to give you more than just a pretty sermon yes. and a pretty song. Yes. He wants to show you His power and His glory. Yes. God's going to touch everybody in here tonight that wants to be touched. I believe. Yes. Are, you, are you with me? Yes. Amen. Everybody back here just a minute. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Father. There might be somebody that don't know the Lord. I look around, I think, well, everybody's saved, but I don't know your heart. God knows your heart. Yes. We're going to give you an opportunity right now to meet the King of Glory before we do anything else. Yes. If you don't know Jesus, you need to be saved. More than anything. That's the greatest thing that will ever happen. Is when God's people see people come to the altar and give their heart to Jesus. Nothing more better. Is there anybody? Anybody need to pray before we do anything else? Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Father. Glory to you, Father. I just start praising Him right now. Well, we honor you. Thank you. 
That's not good, but every time he would eat things that were a bit, you know, all the good stuff you say out there watching them. I mean, he's eating candy and cakes and all this good stuff. And every time you would take a bite, it was just like a spiritual muscle. <laughs> just like all of us, like you breathe on some stuff, and, and you were just, I mean, you were enjoying it. And it's going to be a good thing. It's going to be a good season. God's